in your Bible. Good to have your Bible open to check what we are speaking about. We will turn to Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Uh, there is a sheet uh, in Spanish and in Farsi. I hope that helps you to understand the message. Uh, let us pray as we come to God's word. O oh, Father, O oh, Lord, we do pray this morning significance in this time, the true worship of our God. We do pray as your word comes, our lives would be renewed into your way. We pray in our Saviour's name, Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse uh, 25, we're continuing our studies in the book of Luke. And this morning, we want to get serious. We want to get serious in considering our situations we want to be serious about life, our lives. What are we doing with our lives? My life, your life, all of us. Dare I say, particularly the under 25s, I want you to be really thinking because you have many stages ahead, potentially of life, and now is the time to sort out where are you going. But for all of us, the big issues about what life is about. What is life about? What is life about? Life is about following the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about leaving our way and committing to be going his way. So let's get serious about the issues of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you really a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you just playing around at some kind of Christian religion? Or are you going to be open to this passage affecting you this morning about what it is to be a true follower of Jesus Christ? Just a reminder, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, you are going another way, a hell way, a destruction way. So the issues are so very big. A follower of Jesus Christ on his great way to glory or a follower of our own ways on a way to destruction. And that would be particularly concerning this morning if you are in that category of those who are presenting as a follower of Jesus, but you haven't found out, you haven't committed, you haven't got involved. So we are in these passages in Luke's gospel and we're, we're following the Lord Jesus Christ and he is going to glory and he's going through the cross where he will die for our sins and we are called to follow him, called to follow this great Lord and Master. Last time when we considered our studies in Luke's gospel, we were at a feast wonderful feast where we can enjoy God, sharing God, enjoying fellowship with God as we pray and as we study and as we live and as we obey. And we can have that because Jesus Christ has died and opened up the way into this great, great feast, such a great kindness and provision that God has for us. Well, we really do have to go the true way of Jesus Christ to enter into that feast. Doesn't just happen. So get, get your eyes on the passage and see what the first statement is in the passage this morning. It says, there was a large group of people. 
And they were just following Jesus. And what does the Lord Jesus do? What does he do? What does he do? Verse 25. What does he do? Turns around. He turns to them. It's if he's saying, I don't want any casual followers. I don't want people just to drift along in the crowd. I want you to know what you're doing. So we see there, he turns and says to them, he's going to speak to them about what it is to be a true follower, a real follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. One who is really going his way. And he's going to address these people and he's going to address us that if you are if you are doing certain things then verse 26 it says at the end such a person cannot be my disciple end of verse 27 such a person cannot be my disciple end of verse 33, such a person cannot be my disciple. Three times it says, such people cannot be my disciple. Doesn't say they'll be inferior disciples or they'll be disciples who, are, yeah, they're not just top of the category. They're a bit lower down. It says not disciples. So there's some big stuff in this morning. Big stuff for my life, big stuff for, for your life. Uh, in a sense, I, I give you the opportunity now. <laughs> we're, we're in God's work. If you don't want to be challenged, if you don't want to consider the big issues of life, then probably best you might want to leave now. <laughs> you might want to leave. Because looking at this passage, it's pretty searching as regards to us getting serious about our lives and who we are or what we are. Okay, let's go in then. And we're thinking about what it is to be a disciple. We're thinking about getting serious about life. So think about our relationships. First of all, think about our relationships. The basic point of verse 26 is what? Jesus must be the most important relationship. Our relationship with the Lord Jesus must be the most important relationship. It must be beyond any other relationship. So see what it says there in verse uh, 26, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father or mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own self, he cannot be my uh, disciples. So basically, we're called to hate. Now, that seems strong. We agree that seems strong. Hate, that seems strong. Two things there. You go back to uh, Genesis 29, you'll see a, a man there called Jacob. Uh, he had a, a lot of love for a, a, a lady by Rachel. And the love that he had was so great for Rachel that the love and affection he had for the interest he had in Rachel's sister Leah was considered to be hatred. Okay? So it's a comparison. It's as if he loved Rachel so much that any affection he had for Leah was like hate. Okay? So it's a comparison. We are to have such a, such a passionate love for our Lord Jesus Christ that any loves are like hatred. Does that make sense? So we are called to honor our parents. We are called to love our wives and our husbands. We are called to care for our children. It's not a, this is not a, a saying, well, now kick out, you know, just reject any other relationships. What it's basically saying your love for the Lord Jesus Christ should be so passionate, so big, so intense, so beyond all other loves that all other loves are seen as hate in comparison. Because he's everything to you. He's the one that you love. He's the one that you adore. And it, gets, it even gets a further twist when it says, even your love for yourself, even your care for yourself, even your affection for yourself should be seen as hatred in comparison. So this not, is not the rejection of all other relationships. They are right and proper, but it is saying the love for the Lord Jesus Christ should be so passionate that all other loves are like hatred. Why should you love the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Why should you have this passionate interest in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why should you be devoted to him? Simply because he's the one who opens up the way to the feast. He opens up the way into the beautiful enjoyment of all that is good. He's the one who is giving you the forgiveness of sins by dying on the cross. He is the one who is now in heaven for you, watching over you, caring for you, speaking up for you in heaven. He is the one who has brought you to God by shedding his blood. He is the one who is coming back for you to take you home, to dwell with him forever. He is your beloved Jesus Christ the Lord. He has given you blessings for now and forever. And the more you start to think about it, I am only a Christian. I am only in the blessings of God because of Jesus Christ. The more you think about it, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? It's a no-brainer. We should love him so much more than any other loves because we owe him so much more than any other, anybody else. And we have. Oh, and he's the Lord of glory. And he's come to rescue me from our sins. And so I just want to love him. I just want to live for him. I want to be his disciple. So to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, if we're putting it in a positive way, in verse 26, is to be one who loves the Lord Jesus Christ so much that any other love or any other relationship or affection is seen as hatred. Would they say that about you and me? Would they say when they observed? Yeah, I think he's passionate about Jesus. I think he, I think they really do love the Lord Jesus, you know. Yeah. I emphasize again, this is not saying give up on all other relationships. Not at all. <laughs> it is saying Jesus is so, 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 so much bigger. Love him. Second thing then, as we thought about our relationship, we'll think about our passions, our passions, our, we might say, what really our interests, our desires, our, well, let's go into verse 27 and see what happens in verse uh, 27. Uh, we'll see here. Someone's carrying the cross. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What's the background here? What's the, at the time of the Lord Jesus, time when he was saying this, when you saw somebody bearing their cross, where were they going? When you saw somebody bearing their cross, where were they going? They were going to die. <laughs> they were going to die. So if you think about somebody, uh, just think about somebody who, who very possibly a convicted criminal, and they'd be, uh, it had been appointed that they were going to die on a cross, and they'd have a cross, and they'd be carrying it, and they'd be going to this, they're the, the going to their death. So they'd walk past their workplace, won't be going there again, will they? They'd walk past their homes, won't be going there again, will they? They'd walk past their shops will be going there again she's dead the dead to those things because their cross is declaring that finish with those things there's only one thing ahead and that is death and the cross finished with it all finished with it all all it is ahead is what is ahead now what is that to mean here what is that to mean here. You see, when we are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to take up our cross. We are to say we are finished with living for ourselves. We are finished with the ways of this world. We're finished with building houses so that we can display them and tell everybody how wonderful we are. 
We are finished with pursuing every way of getting to the top in our job. We are finished with using people for our own ends so that we will make progress. We are finished with the ways of this world, gathering things for me, getting things for me, me getting everything that I want. We have a cross on us which says, finish with us. There was a man, I think he was in Glasgow. He was converted to the Lord Jesus Christ really converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what his work, work colleagues said about him? They said, he may as well be dead. All his old interests have passed away. All the passions that seemed to dominate him previously, not interested. He's not living for them anymore. He's got a cross. He's going ahead. Following, of course, the man of the cross, who took that cross to be finished with the way of this world. Pursuit of our own ways. Going to glory. We follow, we follow him. So what are your passions? The people say that you're really passionate about the ways of God, passionate about that which is of eternity, passionate about m learning more of God, passionate about encouraging others to become stronger Christians, passionate about sharing the gospel, passionate about mission. Those are the things that are now the things that are occupying you because your passions are the passions we might say that are not of this world, they're of another world. Colossians 3 and verses 1 to 4, we read this. If then, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your, set your, set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and you are, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, I'm not saying we don't have to look after our affairs in this world. I'm not saying we don't take interest in the politics and affairs of this world. But I am saying the things that are our passions are the things that are of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his kingdom and of his gospel and of his great workings. So would they say that of you and me? Would they? Would they say, ah, oh, yeah, he's, ah, uh, oh, yeah, I know he's living for another world. I know his passions are not in this world. I don't understand him. Don't, don't expect the world to understand you. What would your work colleague said about? Him? They said, well, he's just like one of us. He does the same things. He, he, he's got the same interests, speaks the same way. What would they say, ah, oh, there's something different there. There's something different. There should be something different, brothers and sisters. Not different, strange, but different as regards to our passions and our motivations. Let's come to the third point then, as regards to being a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a very interesting point. We're going to think about our projects here. We're going to think about our projects. We've got three projects here. We've got three projects in verses 28 through to 33. Three projects. Let's just see. The first one, the first project is, look at it. What, do you, what would you say? Uh, we want to learn the word of God together. Uh, verses 28 through to 30. The first project is a building project. Yeah, it's all right. It's a building project. The building project. And a wise builder, what will a wise builder do? 
the wise builder will make sure he's got the resources beforehand to finish the project. Because if he only lays the foundation, then everybody will look and say, what a fool. Why lay the foundation? What a waste of time. You haven't, you haven't got the resources in the first place. What a fool. He should have known that he couldn't finish the job. You might even know building projects like that. If somebody started and they couldn't finish. The second project, what's the second project? The second project is a military project. And a man is going out to war, or a king is going out to war. We'll read of it in verse 31 then. This king, he's, he's going to encounter another king. And so what's he going to do? He's going to weigh up the chances of winning the war, isn't he? He's going to weigh up the chances of winning the war. So he's got 10,000 troops. The other king has got how many? The other king's got 20,000 troops. So he's thinking, this is probably going to be a struggle. You know, all things being equal, same sort of military stuff. We're going to, it's not going to be worth it, is it? And so he'll do what? He'll get a peace deal, won't he? You say, oh, we'll, we'll do with a better, we'll get the best peace we can. Because going to war is just going to be a waste of time because it's just reasonable to weigh things up, isn't it? As regards to the project at hand, you weigh things up. We're all doing this all, all, all the time, aren't we? You know, if you're cooking a meal and you start cooking a meal and, you know, you're going for some, uh, so, some uh, a nice big shepherd's pie, should we go for? You're on a nice big shepherd's pie. Yeah. Well, you've got no potatoes and you've got no meat. You're not going to go any further, very far, are you? You, know, you say, well, go make your shepherd's pie. You haven't got the resources. There's a third project here. What's the third project? What's the third project? In verse 33. What's the project? What is it? It's to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. To take on this project. That's what you do when you become a Christian. You say, I'm going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going for this. That project is one that I want to get involved in. Perhaps you're thinking about that. Perhaps you are. And I really hope you are. If you're not a Christian, perhaps you're here. And perhaps you're wondering. And perhaps you're starting to think about being a Christian. Well, being a Christian is to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you to think. You younger ones. I said, you 20, under 25-year-olds really be thinking about these things. What it is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus the project here is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Well, from the lessons we've learned from the two projects, first two projects, what would it be reasonable according to this way of the world, according to the world's way to conclude? It would be conclude, I've got to have the resources to complete the project. So I come to being the, well, let's stop there because we're going the wrong way. <laughs> we're going the wrong way because Verse, 20, verse 33 has a, a big twist in it. Look at it. It's got a big twist in it. Because it basically says, you'll only be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ if you realize you can bring nothing. In fact, you must bring nothing. In fact, you must realize I can't do it. It's not my resources, it's not my energy, it's not my money, it's not my anything. That won't complete the project. Well, just read what it says. I'll read it. Verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's only the ones who renounce all of their own efforts, all of their own strength, all of their own power, all of their own position, all of their own thinking, all of their own anything and everything that can be a disciple. Else you're going to fail. You come with your own strength. You show up at church and say, hey, I've got this big job. I'm a, I've got a really important position at, uh, in my job. I'll be a good disciple. No, you won't. You'll be a complete failure. Because the word of God says what? You've got to say, my money, no, my, my, my everything, no, 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 no. 
It's simply God who works to make us disciples. It's God's resources. It's God's power. It's God's spirit. It's God's wisdom. It's God's word, all flowing by the spirit, all coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a powerful twist here, isn't there? The building project, a military project, get all your resources. The discipleship project, your resources. No, no, no. You bring your resources, you fail. You just say, I can't do it. Where's this going to take us? It's going to take us to think then about discipleship, isn't it? First of all, the thing is to become a Christian, you, may come, you must become bankrupt, realizing you're a sinful, wrecked, wretched rebellious being who just casts yourself before God and says, receive me in the name of Jesus on the basis of his shed blood, I come. Then he will receive you. Then he will receive you. Have some of you said, oh, this goes back to where we started. Some of you have said you're a Christian, but you've never, this has never dawned upon you. You've just thought it's a bit of an addition to my nice life. It isn't. It's the radical crashing of your previous life and the radical renewing of everything from Jesus Christ. And then we go into the way of being a disciple. Uh, fellow Christians, I trust we're examining ourselves. I trust this is, I, I, I do hope this is a bit uncomfortable. It should be. It should be. I want to be uncomfortable as well. And I trust I have been even as I prepared this past to preach. It. But are we guilty of losing our way? And we have started to bring our own, our own, our own. And we are not renouncing every day. This is discipleship. Every day I should get up and say, I renounce, I renounce myself and my possessions into yourself, Lord. I renounce. I give it all up. I, I, I just say, Lord, it's got to be you again today. It's got to be you totally today, and then I can be your disciple. Otherwise, it's a, it's a no-hoper, isn't it? I think this is radical. I really do. Because it's just totally counterintuitive and countercultural. <laughs> Because the world says, you be you, you assert everything you've got. The gospel says, in a sense, you become you when you give everything up for Christ. How do you know? How do you know that somebody is, is doing verse 33 stuff? How did Ananias, how was he going to find out that Saul of Tarsus was no longer a terrorist, but a true Christian? How is he to know? How will people know that Felton Evangelical Church is a church that's got true discipleship and really serious about discipleship? How will people know? People will say they're a praying people. That's what Ananias was told. Saul of Tarsus has changed because now he's praying. When you're praying, you're saying, I'm not dependent upon me, Lord. I'm not trusting me. I'm trusting you, Lord. I want your resources. I want your strength. I want your wisdom. I want your plans. That's why I exhort us again to be a church that's giving ourselves to prayer. Giving ourselves to prayer. I think we've got a lot of improving to do, dare I say, brothers and sisters. When we have times of prayer, are you saying, yes, that's the place to be? Yes, I've got to be there. Or are you saying, well, don't let that pass by? True disciples are praying people because praying people have renounced all. All right, what are you then? So we thought this morning about discipleship and relationships. He is first. Oh, yes. We thought this morning about discipleship and passions. Oh, yes, he is my passion and his kingdom is my passion. We thought this morning about, about discipleship and our projects. The project is discipleship and everything that comes from that. And I'm saying 
I, I don't bring any resources, he's got the resources. Then finally, we're thinking about perseverance. Perseverance in verses 34 and 35, salt. Salt. Anybody use salt? Anybody use salt this week? Anybody had salt? Salt's an incredible thing, isn't it? I came, a website, I came across a website which said 60 uses of salt, excluding uses for cooking. So that's quite a lot, isn't it? Because some of the ones we immediately think about are cooking uses, aren't we? It gives flavor. It preserves things. Anything else about salt? Apparently, given the hot weather, if you've got, if you've got shoes that have got a bit, sprinkle a few grains of salt in and that'll take away some of the bad odor. By cleaning as well, it's a disinfectant, isn't it? Salt, what a great thing, isn't it? Salt has so many uses and is so powerful. But when salt has lost its saltiness, it's just, just what? Useless. You should not even, you, you should not, don't even throw it on the manure heap. You know, it's just, just, it's that useless that it's beyond useless. You just throw it away. What's this teaching us? I think verses 34 and 35 are teaching us about perseverance perseverance the true christian is proven not by their first profession but by their perseverance by their continuance yes we make the profession yes we declare jesus as lord but that is proven in the life of discipleship in the life of this, this, this fresh saltiness in my life, as I know that, that I've got this sense of something different working in my life that's giving me this essence of impact because there is the working of God in my life. But it says salt is good. Yeah, it's good. Keep the salt going and you'll be a good disciple. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? How are you responding to that? Because he goes on and says, it's of no use either for the soil or for the manure heap. It's thrown away. It's thrown away. What are we feeling about that? I'll, I'll give you a warning. You could have made the profession. But all that we might say Stuff you felt at the beginning has just gone away. And actually, it wasn't genuine at all. You've never been a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just gone. It, it was just some sort of feeling. And your life shows. There's no soul. There's no vegan. There's no stuff that's making an impact. You need to come to Christ. Don't tell me you, you, you went to some meeting 20 years ago and something happened. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I want to know now. Are you a disciple? Are you showing that vigor? Because if you're not, it's very likely what happened that 20 years ago is just nothingness. You need to come to Christ. You need to come today. Find him. Become a disciple and believe in him. Or it's perhaps this is niggling at you and you're thinking, ooh, I am feeling I've drifted away. I am feeling that, 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 that something of the saltiness has gone. Well, I, I think the Lord is saying, then get back. Get back. Get back to know that life which is making your life effective, making you to have an impact as you stand for righteousness and as you hate sin and as you love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a little bit like... Thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I'll return to you. Perhaps that's the message that you've really got to seal this morning. Come back. Come back. It's interesting that phrase at the end of the passage, isn't it? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Where does that remind you of? Well, what does that remind you of? For those of you who've got, who know your Bible, what does that remind you of? It's, it's the seven churches. So seven churches, that was a message to them every time. 
It's a message to us today. Are we, are we a salty church? Are you a salty individual? The first church in the seven churches was Ephesus that had lost its first love. Lost its love for the Lord. Interesting as well, they hadn't got any prayer going on in that church. They needed to repent. Is that a challenge to us? Challenge to you individual to come back. Come back to the Lord. Get your saltiness. Perhaps others don't know because you're still carrying it off and you're looking Christian, but you know in your heart things are drift. Come back. Acknowledge it. Be returning right now in the Lord's presence and say, Lord, I want this life. I want this life from you. I want this saltiness. I want this love for you. The passion for you. you're looking at others and you're wondering whether they're Christians and and that's something that's reasonable to do at the time at times what God is saying to you where are you at this morning are you really with me great if this message has a big impact upon us moving forward really really going deep really going into our hearts I want to come to conclusion then are you really a disciple Am I really a disciple? There was a man called Morris Flitcroft. There was a man called Morris Flitcroft. And in 1974, he came across golf. He was a crane operator in Barrow and Furnace shipyards. But he came interested in golf. And you know what he tried to do? He achieved it, actually. He got into the British Open. He really, somehow or other, got into a British Open. And there'd never been anybody quite like him before. Because he was a fake. He wasn't a golfer at all. And over the years after that, he gave himself different names and he was continually trying to get into the British Open and other golf tournaments, but he was no golf. What about you? Maurice Flipcroft was not the genuine article. Are you the genuine article? Are you a true disciple? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a great Christian man in the Second World War. He was in Germany and he was seeking to honor God during the days of the Nazi regime. And he was killed by the Nazis shortly before the end of the Second World War in 1945. And he said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Dare I say, dear brothers and sisters at Felton Evangelical Church, and dear friends, all of you gathered today, I say to you, if Christ is once again coming to call you, he is calling you to come and die. And then you'll find life. And then you'll really live. Because it's the great change of the Christian gospel. When we die to ourselves and we come to Christ, we find life. So I come back. Let's get serious. Let's get serious about life. Life is in being a disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing our final hymn this morning, which really picks up uh, one of the themes we've had, which is our dependence upon the Lord.